Chapter 2, The Shadow of the Past, Part 2. Gollum, said Frodo. Gollum, do you mean that this is the very... That the, <laughs> I need to take a look. That this is the very Gollum creature that Bilbo met? How loathsome. I think it is a sad story, said the wizard. And it might have happened to others, even to some hobbits that I have known. I can't believe that Gollum is connected with hobbits, however distantly, said Frodo with some heat. What an abominable notion. It is true all the same, replied Gandalf. About their origins, at any rate, I know more than hobbits do themselves, and even Bilbo's story suggests the kinship. There was a great deal in the background of their minds and memories that was very similar. They understood one another remarkably well. Very much better than a hobbit would understand, say, a dwarf, or an orc, or even an elf. Think of the riddles they both knew, for one thing. Yes, said Frodo, though other folk besides hobbits ask riddles, and much of the same sort, and hobbits don't cheat. Gollum meant to cheat all the time, he was just trying to put poor Bilbo off his guard, and I dare say it amoved, amused his wickedness to start a game which might end in providing him with an easy victim, but if he but if he lost would not worry him. Only too true, I fear, said Gandalf, but there was something else in it, I think, which you don't see yet. Even Gollum was not wholly ruined, he had provided tougher than even one of the wise would have guessed as a hobbit might. There was a corner of his mind that was still his own, and light came through it, as through a chink in the dark, light out of the past. It's actually pleasant, I think, to hear a kindly voice again, bringing up memories of wind, and trees, and sun on the grass, and such forgotten things. But that, of course, would only make the evil part of him angrier in the end unless it could be conquered, unless it could be cured. Gandalf sighed, Alas, there is little hope of that for him. Yet, not no hope. No, not though he possessed the ring so long, almost as far back as he can remember, for it was long since he had worn it much, in the black darkness it was seldom needed. Certainly he had never faded. He is thin and tough still. But the thing was eating up his mind, of course, and the torment had become almost unbearable. All the great secrets under the mountains had turned out to just empty, turned out to be just empty night. There was nothing more to find out, nothing worth doing, only nasty, furtive eating, and resentful remembering. He was altogether wretched. He hated the dark, he hated the light more, he hated everything, and the ring most of all. "'What do you mean?' said Frodo. "'Surely the ring was his precious, and the only thing he cared for. But if he hated it, why didn't he get rid of it, or go away and leave it?' You ought to begin to understand, Frodo, after all you have heard, said Gandalf. He hated it and loved it, as he hated and loved himself. He could not get rid of it. He had no will in the matter. A ring of power looks after itself, Frodo. It may slip off treacherously, but its keeper never abandons it. At most he plays with the idea of handing it on to someone else's care, and that's only at an early stage, when it first begins to grip. But as far as I know, Bilbo alone in history has ever gone beyond playing and really done it. He needed all of my help too, and even so he would never have just forsaken it or cast it aside. It was not Gollum, Frodo, but the ring itself that decided him things. The ring left him. What, just in time to meet Bilbo? said Frodo. Would it an orc have suited it better? That is no laughing matter, said Gandalf. Not for you. It was the strangest even in the whole history of the ring so far. Bilbo's arrival just at that time, and putting his hand on it blindly in the dark. There was more than one power at work, Frodo. 
The ring was trying to get back to its master. It had slipped from Isildur's hand and betrayed him. When a chance came, it caught poor Deagle, and he was murdered. And after that Gollum, and it had devoured him. It could make no further use of him. He was too small and mean, and as long as it stayed with him, he could never leave his deep pool again. So now, when its master was awake once more, and sending out his dark thought for Mirkwood, it abandoned Gollum, only to be picked up by the most unlikely person imaginable, Bilbo from the Shire. Beyond that, there was something else at work, beyond any design of the Ringmaker. I can put no put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the Ring, and not by its Maker, in which case you were also meant to have it, and that might be an encouraging thought. It is not, said Frodo, though I am not sure that I understand you, but now you have learned all, but how have you learned about this all of, <laughs> but how have you learned all about the ring and about Gollum? Do you really know it all, or are you still just guessing? Gandalf looked at Frodo, and his eyes glinted. I knew much, and I have learned much, he answered, but I am not going to give an account of all of my doings to you. The history of Elendil and Isildur and the One Ring is known to all of the wise. Your ring is shown to be that one ring by the firelighting writing alone, apart from any other evidence. And when did you discover that? asked Frodo, interrupting. Just now in this room, of course, answered the wizard sharply. But I expected to find it. I have come back from dark journeys and long search to make that final test. It is the last proof, and it is now only too clear. Making out Gollum's part and fitting it into the gap in the history required some thought. I may have started with guesses about Gollum, but I am not guessing now. I know. I have seen him. You have seen Gollum? exclaimed Frodo in amazement. Yes, the obvious thing to do, of course, if one could. I tried long ago, but I have managed it at last. Then what happened after Bilbo escaped from him? Do you know that? Not so clearly. What I have told you is what Gollum was willing to tell, though not, of course, in the way I have reported it. Gollum is a liar. You have to sift his words. For instance, he called the ring his birthday present, and he stuck to that. He said it came from his grandmother, who had lots of beautiful things of that kind. A ridiculous story. I have no doubt that Smeagol's grandmother was a matriarch, a great person in her way, but to talk of her possessing many elven rings was absurd, and as for giving them away, it was a lie. But a lie with a grain of truth. The murder of Deagle haunted Gollum, and he made up a defense, repeating it to his precious over and over again, as he gnawed on bones in the dark until he almost believed it. It was his birthday. Deagle ought to have given the ring to him. It had obviously turned up so as to be a present. It was his birthday present, and so on and so on. I endured him as long as I could, but the truth was desperately important. In the end, I had to be harsh. I put the fear of fire on him and wrung out the true story, bit by bit, together which is with much sniveling and snarling. He thought that he was misunderstood and ill-used, but when he had at last told me his history, as far as the end of the riddle game and Bilbo's escape, he would say, not say any more, except in dark hints. Some other fear was on him, greater than mine. He muttered that he was going to get his own back. People would see, it, people would see if he would stand being kicked and driven into a hole and then robbed. Gollum had good friends now, good friends and very strong. They would help him. Baggins would pay for it. That was his chief thought. He hated Bilbo and cursed his name. What is more, he knew where he came from. 
But it, how did he find that out? Asked Frodo. Well, as for the name, Bilbo was very... Bilbo very foolishly told Gollum himself, and after that it would not be too difficult to discover his country. Once Bil Gollum came out, of course, he came out, his longing for the ring proved stronger than his fear of the orcs, or even the fear of the light. After a year or two he left the mountains. You see, though still bound by desire of it, the ring was no longer devouring him. He began to revive a little. He felt old, terribly old, yet less timid, and he was mortally hungry. Hello, and yes. Fellowship of the Ring. Lord of the Ring. Light, light of sun and moon. He still feared and hated, and he always will, I think, but he was cunning. He found he could hide from daylight and moonshine, and made his way swiftly and softly by dead of night with his pale, cold eyes and catch small, frightened, or unwary things. He grew stronger and bolder with new food and new air. He found his way into Mirkwood, as one would expect. Is that where you found him? asked Frodo. I saw him there, answered Gandalf, but before that he had wandered far, following Bilbo's trail. It was difficult to learn anything from him for certain, but his talk was constantly interrupted by curses and threats. What has it, what had it got in its pockets is, he said. I wouldn't say, no precious little cheat, not a fair question. It cheated first, it did. It broke the rules. We ought to have squeezed it. Yes, precious, and we will, precious. That is a sample of his talk. I don't suppose you want any more. I had weary days of it. But from hints dropped among the snarls, I gathered that his padding feet had taken him at last to Asgaroth, and even to the streets of Dale, listening secretly and peering. Well, the news of the great events went far and wide in Wilderland, and many had heard Bilbo's name and knew where he came from. We made no secret of our return journey to his home in the West. Gollum's sharp ears would soon learn what he wanted. Thank you for the follow, and I hope you're having a good day. Oh. Then why didn't he track Bilbo further? asked Frodo. Why didn't he come to the Shire? Ah, said Gandalf, now we will come to it. I think Gollum tried to. He set out and came back westward as far as the green Great River. But then he turned aside. He was not daunted by the distance, I am sure. No, something else drew him away. So my friends think those that haunted him for me. Hunted him for me. The wood elves tracked him first. An easy task for them, for his trail was still fresh then. Though Mirkwood, through Mirkwood, and back again it led them, though they never caught him. The wood was full of the rumor of him, dreadful tales, even among beasts and birds. The woodmen said there was some, said there was some new terror abroad, a ghost that drank blood. It climbed trees and f to find nests. It crept into holes to find the young. It slipped through windows to find cradles. But at the western edge of Mirkwood, the trail turned away. It wandered off in southwards, and passed out of the wood elves' ken, and was lost. And I made a great mistake. Yes, Frodo, it was not the first, though I fear it may prove the worst. I let the matter be. I let him go, for I had much else to think of at the time, and I still trusted the lore of Saruman. Lord of the Rings, book one. Well, that was years ago. I have paid for it since with many dark and dangerous days. The trail was long cold when I took it up again, after Bilbo left here, and my search would have been in vain but for the help that I had from a friend, Aragorn, the greatest traveler and huntsman of his age in the world. Together we sought for Gollum down the whole length of Wilderland, without hope and without success. But, at last, when I had given up the chase and turned to other parts, Gollum was found. My friend returned out of great perils, bringing the miserable creature with him. Hello. 
What he had been doing he would not say. He only wept and called us cruel, with many a golem in his throat, and when we pressed him he whined and cringed and rubbed his long hands, licking his fingers as if they pained him. Then he remembered, as if he remembered some old torture. But I am afraid there is no possible doubt. He made his slow, sneaking way, step by step, mile by mile, south, down, at last to the land of Mordor. A heavy silence fell in the room. Frodo could hear his heart beating. Even outside, everything seemed still. No sounds, sound of Sam's shears could now be heard. Yes, to Mordor, said Gandalf. Alas, Mordor draws, draws all wicked things, and the dark power was bending all its will to gather him them there. The ring of the enemy would leave its mark too, leave him open to the summons, and all folk were whispering then of a new shadow in the south, and its hatred of the west. There were, there were, this, were this fine new friends. There were his fine new friends who would help him out would help him in his revenge. Wretched fool, in the land he would learn much, too, much for his comfort, and sooner or later as he lurked and pried on the borders, he would be caught and taken for examination. That was the way of it, I fear. When he was found, he had already been there long and was on his way back on some errand of mischief. But that does not matter much now. His worst mischief was done. Yes, alas, though him the through him the enemy was learned has learned that the one has been found again. He knows where Isildur fell, he knows where Gollum found his ring, and he knows that it that it is a great ring, for it gave long life. He knows that it is not one of the three, for they have never been lost, and they endure no evil. He knows that it was not one of the seven or the nine, for they are accounted for. He knows that it is the one, and he and uh, he has at last heard, I think, of hobbits and the Shire. The Shire, he may be seeking for it now. He has if he has not already found out where it lies. Indeed, Frodo, I fear that he may even think of the long, unnoticed name of Baggins, and that it has become important. But this is terrible, cried Frodo, far worse than the worst that I imagined from your hints and warnings. O oh, Gandalf, best of friends, what am I to do? For now I am really afraid. What am I to do? What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand, pity and mercy, not to strike without need, and he has been well, well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took that he took so little hurt from evil and escaped in the end, because he began his ownership of the ring so with pity. I am sorry, said Frodo, but I am frightened, and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. You have not seen him, Gandalf broke in. No, and I don't want to, said Frodo. I can't understand you. You mean to say that you and the elves have let him live on in those terrible, de horrible deeds? Now, at any rate, he is as bad as an orc, just an enemy. He deserves death. Deserves it, I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it, and he is bound up with the fate of the ring. My heart tells me that he has some part to play yet, for good or ill, before the end. Lost my Cannot be can be cured before he dies, but there's a chance of it. Wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there's a chance of it. And he is bound up with the phrase of the ring. Mm -hmm. 
He has a part to play yet for good or ill before the end, and when that comes, the pity of Bilbo may rule the fate of many, yours not least. In any case, we did not kill him. He is very old and very wretched, and the wood elves have him in prison, but they treat him with such kindness as they can find in their wise hearts. <laughs> I know. All the same, all the same, said Frodo, even if Bilbo could not kill Gollum, I wish that he had not kept the ring. I wish he had never found it, and that I had not got it. Why did you let me keep it for? Why did you let me keep it? Why didn't you make me throw it away, or just destroy it? Let you? Make you, said the wizard. Haven't you been listening to all that I have said? You are not thinking of what you are saying. But as for throwing it away, that was obviously wrong. These rings have a way of being found. In evil hands, it might have done great evil. Worst of all, it might have fallen into the hands of the enemy. Indeed, it certainly would. For this is the one, and he is exerting all his power to draw it to himself. Of course, my dear Frodo, it was dangerous for you, and it has troubled me deeply. But there was so much at stake that I had to take some risk, even when I was far away. There has never been a day when the Shire has th has not been guarded by watchful eyes. As long as you have never used it, I did not think that the ring would have had any lasting effect on you. Not for evil, not at any rate for a very long time, and you must remember that nine years ago when I last saw you, I knew little for certain. But why not destroy it, as you say should have been done long ago? cried Frodo again. If you had warned me or even sent me a message, I would have done away with it. Would you? How would you do that? How have you ever tried? No, but I suppose one hammer it one could hammer it or melt it. Try, said Gandalf. Try now. Frodo drew the ring out of his pocket again and looked at it. It now appeared plain and smooth, without mark or device that he could see. The gold looked very fair and pure, and Frodo thought how rich and beautiful of its color, and how perfect was its roundness. It was an admirable thing and altogether precious. When he took it out, he had intended to fling it from him into the very hottest part of the fire. But he found now that he could not do so, not without a great struggle. He weighed the ring in his hand, hesitating and forcing himself to remember all that Gandalf had told him, and then with an effort of will he made a movement as if to cast it away, but he found that he had put it back in his pocket. Gandalf left grimly. You see, already you too, Frodo, cannot easily let it go, nor will to damage it, and I would not make you except by force which would break your mind. As for the breaking of the ring, force is useless. Even if you took it and struck it with a heavy sledgehammer, it would make no dint in it. It cannot be unmade by your hands or by mine. Your fire is small, of course. It would not melt even ordinary gold. This ring has already passed through it unscathed and even unheated. But there is no smith's forge in this shire that could change it at all. Not even the anvils and furnaces of the dwarves could do that. It has been said that dragon fire could melt and consume rings of power, but there is not now any dragon left on earth in which the old fire is hot enough. Nor is there any dragon, not even Anselagon the Black, who could have harmed the one ring, the ruling ring, for that was made by Sauron himself. There is only one way. To find the cracks of doom in the depths of Or Ordurin, the fire mountain, and cast the ring in there. If you really wish to destroy it, to put it beyond the gas grasp of the enemy forever. I do really wish, wish to destroy it, cried Frodo. Or, well, to have it destroyed. I am not made for perilous, perilous quests. I wish I would have never seen the ring. Why did it come to me? Why was I chosen? Thank you, Pippikind. 
Macam mana? Okay, dah cukup Sebab dia ada kerja Such questions cannot be answered, said Gandalf. You may be sure that it was not for any merit that others do not possess, not for power or wisdom at any rate, but you have been chosen. You must therefore use such strength and heart and wits as you have. But I so have so little of any of these things. You are wise and powerful. Will you not take the ring? Of course. No, cried Gandalf, springing to his feet. With that power I should have the power to have power too great and terrible, and over me the white ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. His eyes flashed and his face was lit by a fire within. Do not tempt me, for I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart is by pity, pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me, I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe, unused. The wish to wield it would be too great for my strength. I shall have ha I still have such need of it. Great perils lie before me. He went to the window and drew aside the curtains and the shutters. Sunlight streamed back again into the room. Sam passed along the path outside whistling. And now, said the wizard, turning back to Frodo, the decision lies with you, but I will always help you. He laid his hand on Frodo's shoulder. I will help you bear this burden, as long as it is yours to bear, but we must do something soon. The enemy is moving. There was a long silence. Gandalf sat down again and puffed at his pipe, as if lost in thought. His eyes seemed closed, but under the lids he was watching Frodo intently. Frodo gazed fixedly at the red embers on the hearth, until they filled all his vision and he seemed to be looking down into profound wells of fire. He was thinking of the fabled cracks of doom and the... <coughs> and the... <coughs> Fab... Okay. Water. All right. <laughs> Loud of talking. Into profound wells of fire. He was thinking about the fabled cracks of doom and the terror of the fiery mountain. Well, said Gandalf at last, what are you thinking about? Have you decided what to do? No, answered Frodo, coming back to himself out of darkness and finding to his surprise that it was not dark and that out of the window he could still see sunlight, a sunlight gar sunlit garden. Or perhaps, yes, as far as I understand what you have said, I suppose I must keep the ring and guard it, at least for the present, whatever it may do to me. Whatever it may do, it will be slow, slow to evil, if you keep it with that purpose said Gandalf. I hope so, said Frodo, but I hope that you may find some other better keeper soon. But in the meantime, it seems that I am a danger, a danger to all that live near me. I cannot keep the ring and stay here. I ought to leave Bag End, leave the Shire, leave everything, and go away. I'm glad you're enjoying, and thank you for rest. I would like to s I would like to save the Shire if I Who is talking? I should like to save the Shire if I could, though there have been times when I thought the inhabitants too stupid and dull for words, and have felt that an earthquake or an invasion of dragons might do good for them, but I don't feel like that now. I feel as long as the Shire lies behind safe and comfortable, I shall find wandering more bearable. 
I shall know that somewhere there is a firm foothold, even if my feet cannot stand there again. Of course, I have sometimes thought of going away, but I imagined that as a kind of holiday. A series of adventures like Bilbo's are better ending in peace. But that would mean exile, a fight, f a flight from danger into danger, drawing it after me, and I suppose I must go alone, if I am able to do that and save the Shire. But I feel very small and very uprooted and, well, desperate. The enemy is so strong and terrible. He did not tell Gandalf, but as he was speaking, a great desire to follow Bilbo flamed up in his heart, to follow Bilbo and even perhaps find him again. It was so strong that it overcame his fear. He could almost have run out there and then down the road without his hat, as Bilbo had done similar on a similar morning long ago. "'My dear Frodo,' exclaimed Gandalf, "'hobbits really are amazing creatures, as I have said before. You can learn all there is to know about their ways in a month, and yet after a hundred years they still surprise you at a pinch. I hardly expected to get such an answer, not even from you, but Bilbo made no mistake in choosing his heir, though he little thought how important it would prove. I'm afraid you are right. The ring will not be able to stay hidden in the Shire much longer, and for your own sake as well as for others, you have to go and leave the name of Baggins behind you. That name will not be safe to have outside of the Shire or in the wild. I will give you a traveling name now. When you go, go as Mr. Underhill. But I don't think you need to go alone. Not if you know of anyone you can trust, who would be willing to go by your side and that you would be willing to take in an, into unknown perils. But if you look for a companion, be careful in choosing, and be careful of what you say, even to your closest friends. The enemy has many spies and many ways of hearing. Suddenly he stopped as if listening. Frodo became aware that all was very quiet inside and outside. Gandalf crept into one side of the window. Then, when, with a dart, he sprang to the sill and thrust a long arm out and downwards. There was a squawk, and up came Sam Gamgee's curly head, hauled by one ear. "'Well, bless my beard,' said Gandalf. "'Sam Gamgee, is it? Now what might you be doing?' "'Lord, bless you, Mr. Gandalf, sir,' said Sam. "'Nothing. Last ways I was just trimming the grass border under the window, if you follow me.' He picked up his shears and exhibited them as evidence. I don't, said Gandalf grimly. It is some time since I last heard the sound of your shears. How long is how long has have you been eavesdropping? Eavesdropping, sir. I don't follow you. Begging your pardon, there ain't no eaves at Bag End, and that's a fact. Don't be a fool. What have you heard? Why did you listen? Gandalf's eyes flashed, and his brows stuck out like bristles. "'Mr. Frodo, sir,' cried Sham, Sam, quaking. "'Don't let him hurt me, sir. Don't let him turn me into anything unnatural. My old dad would take on so. I meant no harm. On my honor, sir.' "'He won't hurt you,' said Frodo, hardly able to keep from laughing, though he himself was startled and rather puzzled. "'He knows, as well as I do, that you mean no harm.' But you just up and answer his questions straight, straight away. Well, sir, said Sam, dithering a little, I heard a deal that I didn't rightly understand about an enemy and drinks, and Mr. Bilbo, sir, and dragons, and fiery mountains, and, uh, and elves, sir. I, I listened because I couldn't help myself, if you know what I mean. Lord bless me, sir, but I do love tales of that sort, and I believe them, too, whatever Ted may say. Elves, sir, I would dearly love to see them. Couldn't you take me to see, see elves, sir, when you go? Suddenly Gandalf laughed. Come inside, he shouted, and putting out both of his arms, he lifted the astonished Sam, shears, grass clippings, and all, right through the window and set him on the floor. Take you to see elves, huh? He said, eyeing Sam closely, but with a smile flickering on his face. So you heard that Mr. Frodo's going away? I did, sir, and that's why I choked, but... 
which you weren't heard seemingly, but I tried not to, sir. It just burst out of me. I was so upset. It can't be helped, Sam, said Frodo sadly. He had suddenly realized that flying from the Shire would mean more painful partings than merely saying farewell to the fam familiar comforts of Bag End. I shall have to go, but... And here he looked hard at Sam. If you really care about me, and you will keep that dead secret. See? If you, if you really care about me, you will keep that dead secret. See? If you don't, if you even breathe a word of what you have heard here, then I hope Gandalf will turn you into a spotted toad and fill the garden full of grass snakes. Sam fell on his knees, trembling. Get up, Sam said Gandalf. I have thought of something better than that, something to shut your mouth and punish you properly for listening. You shall go away with Mr. Frodo. Me, sir, cried Sam, springing up like a dog invited for a walk. Me, go and see elves and all. Hooray, he shouted and then burst into tears. <laughs>